Hello everyone, welcome back to Raise Aerospace and Kerbal Space Program 2. During live stream today, somebody expressed frustration about getting to orbit in this game. And so I will do a sort of tutorial at the risk of duplicating what the game already has as far as tutorials, as far as getting to orbit and avoiding wiggliness and other issues. We're going to try and make as simple a rocket as possible that should get to orbit and see if it works. Maybe I'll have some issue too, who knows. Uh, so, uh, first of all, there are these favorites here, and these are probably the things that you should use to try to get to orbit. Uh, that is why they're favorited. Uh, but just in case they're not here for you for some reason, uh, we'll go through the main list. So first command, of course, we want a pod to put our Kerbal in. You don't, strictly speaking, need a Kerbal. You can use a probe core uh, to get to orbit. But then if you have a communication uh, requirement in your save, that might be complicated. So we'll keep it simple. Make sure to have a Kerbal, then you always have control. And then utility, we want the Mark 16 parachute on top. And there's no uh, re-entry heating right now, but I'm still going to put the heat shield for formality's sake because eventually there will be re-entry heating. So if somebody's watching this some other time, uh, you want the heat shield there so that your Kerbal... Oh, we can uh, peek inside. I didn't even realize that. Hey, there's an interior. Okay, so uh, we have that. We want the decoupler. Okay, so small decoupler. For small pod, notice that the only thing that isn't small right now is the parachute that's extra small. And then what we want is a fuel tank. So the decoupler is in coupling. You want that so that you can free the heat shield. Otherwise, if we weren't worried about that, well, also the parachute can't deal with the tank and the engine potentially. Maybe it could, maybe it couldn't. Uh, but anyway, fuel tanks. What sort of fuel tank should you choose? Well, actually, before you select a fuel tank, you should think about your engine. Now in favorites, they've got the Terrier here. That's a good engine because it's fairly efficient with vacuum ISP. Uh, oh, it doesn't want to stay there. You can see uh, at the bottom of the statistics, there's a vacuum ISP of 335. That's better than this engine, which has 320. So this is very good in space. And so for our upper stage, that is what we want. Now you'll notice the maximum thrust is 60 kilonewtons. Uh, I just normally divide that by 10, and I'll give you how many tons it can carry. So we're looking for a uh, six-ton vessel so far, if we use this engine. And you can find the engine, of course, here under Methylox, uh, right here, the Terrier, LV909. And so if we uh, take a look at the engineer report, right now we have a total mass of 1.43. So in fuel tanks, we're looking for something or a combination of tanks that's going to get us to six. So we want 4.5. And so this tank happens to be 4.5. And so we can put that on, put the Terrier on. And that is a good stage. It's uh, going to have a lot of oomph. In fact, down here, it shows you your Delta V, 3,194. That's presumably in vacuum. Now our total mass is a little bit more than six. And that is because the Terrier mass, I didn't actually add that in. But it's fine. It's close enough. And it says thrust weight ratio 0.483. That's for sea level. Uh, this is a vacuum engine. We're going to be using it in uh, mid-air, uh, close to space. Hopefully as close to space as possible. So we're not worried about the thrust weight ratio at sea level. Hopefully. <laughs> okay. Unless something goes horribly wrong. So, yeah. As far as the delta V and the corner there is concerned, so what you need to know is that there is a set amount of speed that you need in order to make orbit. Uh, low orbit around Kerbin, the planet that we're around, is 2,300 meters per second, or thereabouts. And you also need a surplus in order to get through the atmosphere, because the atmosphere is thick and it slows you down. So that surplus that you need, the standard estimate is about 1,700 meters per second that for an Earth-like atmosphere, and Kerbin actually has sort of an Earth-like atmosphere. So it's the same thing to punch through the atmosphere around Kerbin as Earth. It's about 1,700 meters per second. That varies depending on how quickly you can get through the atmosphere. So if you have a high thrust weight ratio, not too high, a uh, high enough thrust weight ratio, you can get through the atmosphere quicker and then use less delta V. Uh, delta V is the total amount of speed that your rocket can build up. So we need Minimum, if there was no atmosphere, 2,300 meters per second, but because there's an atmosphere, we need to add 1,700 to that, so we're looking for 4,000 in that corner. And that's sort of a good estimate, but you can get away with less, like I just said, because you can get through the atmosphere quicker, uh, or you could require more if you've done something horribly wrong. 
Uh, so we need another stage because that's not enough delta V and actually this can't get off the ground right now. Uh, so we want another decoupler, so a small decoupler. And in the favorites, they put this engine, the swivel. That's an excellent choice. And again, take the max thrust, divide by 10, and you can see that this can carry at most 21.5 tons. However, uh, we don't want to get too close to that, otherwise it'll take forever to get through the atmosphere. So we're going to underdo that, and hopefully by a substantial amount. Now the trick here is that the poor little terrier has to get high enough before it ignites, otherwise it's not going to be efficient and not going to have enough thrust. So if we have this situation here, now we got 5,000 there, which is wonderful. And if we expand this here, we can see that we have 2,000 meters per second of delta V on the first stage and 3,194 in the second stage. In truth, this should be enough to get your Kerbal all the way out to the moon. Uh, the booster might be helpful. However, our thrust weight ratio at sea level right now with this engine is 1.137. So that's not great. And so one thing we can do is, since we have so much delta V, maybe we can lighten up. It doesn't have to be an optimal stage up there with the Terrier uh, in order to make it easier for our first stage. Since we don't need to have that much delta V, we could have a smaller tank up there. And so I'm going to switch out, instead of the big tank, we're going to have this tank plus that tank, which is three quarters of the big tank. And that'll make it easier for the Terrier once it takes over. And we still, it's not really that much less delta V to be honest. And now we're at 1.28, which makes me feel better. So this is a very straight standard rocket, no frills. Um, it'll still ascend fairly slowly. And hopefully it's not going to have any joint issues, hopefully. And the swivel gimbals, that's important. One thing that's sort of not very clear here is, uh, you see it says shift view more at the bottom of the stats screen. And if we press shift, and it still doesn't hold it there, but uh, the extra stats show an engine gimbal there. There's another engine that you want to avoid uh, at, uh, if you don't know what you're doing with it, and that's this Reliant engine. This Reliant engine, you know, doesn't have that engine gimbal section because it does not gimbal. That means it cannot control the rocket. Now, your pod has a reaction wheel in it. It has uh, an ability to control the rocket as well. Uh, if we take a look at the pod, we can see that it has a reaction wheel torque of 5 kilonewtons. Now, 5 kilonewtons is nice, but 5 kilonewtons is not that much when your engine is producing 215 kilonewtons. And of course, uh, the bigger the engine, the hotter uh, time the pod is going to have controlling the rocket. So you want the engine to gimbal, which means turn, in order to control the rocket. Otherwise, you're going to be left with the pod's power, which is not much. Okay, so we have a straight rocket here. Let's put a Kerbal inside and see if something horrible goes wrong. And uh, we'll, we'll try Bill. They want to put Bill in uh, first all the time. I will call this Alpha. And let's see if I've done something horrible. Okay, it's got, uh, it's telling me uh, all the basic information again because I forgot to turn off the tutorial stuff. T for SAS control, that should be on. And then uh, Z for throttle up, it's already throttled up. And it seems relatively stable. And launch. I guess we'll have the full countdown. Now you note know, down here it's showing not the delta V that it showed before. And that is because it's showing the sea level delta V right now. And not the delta V uh, in space. Now, uh, usually for reference, I use the space delta V, the vacuum delta V, since that's simpler. Now we're in the dark. Gosh darn it, I should have launched in daylight. Anyway, this is my first nighttime launch in Kerbal Space Program, too. Uh, go up a little bit, and then if you're steering using the keys, uh, press D at about 500 meters. Um, the nav ball is a little bit hard to read, but normally what I do is I aim for. 80 degrees at 2,000 meters, 70 degrees at 4,000 meters, uh, basically 60 degrees at 7 kilometers, and then 45 degrees at 15 kilometers, something like that. And it's a curve. The reason for this is you're basically going up in order to get through the atmosphere. Most of what you want to do is go horizontal. 
So you're basically doing a very extending, extended long jump. The Earth is, the, or Kerbin, is still going to try and pull you down. And you're just going to keep missing it. Because you have jumped so far. Of course, actually doing a jump would, would require quite a lot of excel immediate acceleration, which would squish you to a pulp. So, doing it more gradually is best. Okay, so our first stage is getting done here. And we're getting close to a 30 degree angle. And staging and ignition. So it is the terrier stage now. Note that with this straight rocket, there is no wiggling or anything like that. If there is, you've got a bug. <laughs> you've got a bug. If you have lag with this rocket, with uh, these simple parts, you've probably got a bug too. Unless your system is very old indeed. So, uh, we keep uh, going towards a more horizontal state, and what you want to do is maybe maybe don't have so high a time to apoapsis. Right now I've got 1 minute and 38 seconds. As long as your apoapsis is above 70 kilometers, which is space, uh, you might want to pitch down so that the time to apoapsis goes down. You can also throttle down using control, uh, sorry, the left control key in order to slow down instead of pitching down then you can just pitch to zero zero it, or pointing at the prograde vector is the most optimal situation so throttling down uh quite a lot here apparently uh there we go i want the time to apoapsis to go down and you can take it leisurely uh so we're what we want to do is by the time we're close to the end of the engine burn we are at apoapsis or ap here and that should be in space and yeah, we're a little bit overpowered here. We could use a smaller engine here even. Or maybe a couple of sparks or something like that. We could have also gone with a flatter trajectory earlier on. If you find that you have too much time to apoapsis like right now, we can just shut down for now. And so X, and then coast. Now remember, orbital speed should be about 2,300. We've got way more than what we need here. But for your first few tries, you might want the extra. And I let it go lopsided a bit. Shut down. Uh, orbit is 2,291 right now, 72 kilometer periapsis, which should be in space, and 110 kilometer apoapsis. So as you can see, we have nearly 1,400 meters per second. So even now, we could probably transfer to the moon. Uh, so I'm going to. <laughs> uh, why not? Why not? Uh, we haven't been. I haven't been to it in KSP2 yet. So I'm gonna set target. So, we're, we're actually doing extra credit here. So, how to get to the moon? Well, the old-fashioned way was to wait until the moon appeared above the horizon. Uh, another way is to just make a node over here. If the moon is sort of like... I um, don't know how to describe it. You're going to hit it over there. So, if the moon's there, you want to burn out from, let's say, over here. But really, you could probably shift it a little bit to that side. So if the moon's at 3 o'clock, it started out at 6 o'clock, but you could probably shift it to 7, 8, or 9, or something like that. And... There you get an encounter. And it shows you your periapsis and apoapsis. And I, I, uh, I'm, I'm okay with that for now, but... Uh, it would be too much... Uh, extracurricular activity to talk about free return trajectory. Okay, well, we have a free return trajectory. <laughs> okay, free return trajectory is if you swing by the moon and you end up swinging right back towards Kerbin in such a way that it makes it easy for you to get back into the atmosphere. So there's a nice little flyby of the moon that will allow us to come back. So we'll take it. So yeah, 
let's just do this maneuver. Now, when making the maneuver to the moon, you just uh, pull on the prograde handle, which is the green one that looks like that on the maneuver node. And it should end up being about 800 to 900. So we have 840 meters per second now. If you don't get a free return trajectory, you can make orbit around the moon for about 200 to 300 and then come back for another 200 to 300. So if you uh, sum that all up, even if we didn't have a nice free return trajectory, we probably have enough to uh, make orbit or break orbit. So here you can see the moon is coming up. Uh, if we had moved the maneuver node earlier, we probably could have had a fine time to transfer. Oh, where did it go now? <laughs> yeah, uh, we would probably have had a fine time to transfer just a little while ago and it'd still be all right. But this time is fine too. It's very forgiving. The moon is fairly large, so it sort of sucks you in. Okay, so maneuver. So here's the pods reaction wheel doing everything. I haven't noticed that there's been any electric charge drop as we use the reaction wheel in the pod. So apparently that's not a thing yet. I don't know what an electric charge is for at the moment. Okay, and preparing to go, and go. Okay, well, I don't know, it sort of went into the red there. Did we overdo it for some reason? I think our orbital speed, basically at the end of the burn, it should be about 3,100. Let's see. No fuel. What do you mean, no fuel? It seems confused. Hmm. Let me... Keep burning. Obviously, we didn't quite make it. The maneuver seems a bit confused. Okay, a little bit more. Okay, okay, uh, uh, we went too far. Now we're hitting the moon. That's not good. Okay, so if you go too far, retrograde. That's that one right there. And just a little bit of thrust. Okay, that's good enough. I'll take it. I'll take that. And so, how close are we getting? 233 kilometers. Seems fine to me. It doesn't say we're hitting it. Let's go to the moon. So this is the power of the rocket with a terrier and a swivel. Highly efficient configuration. And we just do nothing. If you wanted a capture around the moon, you could do a burn at periapsis that's retrograde and capture around the moon. We're not particularly close to the moon, but it's okay. Ah, there's the moon. Okay, so what we have here is Kerbin's over there, and the moon's over here. And we're going to pass by at 231 kilometers. First time I've come this close to it in the game so far. And just like that we are departing. And out we go, out of Mooner SOI. And then at Apoapsis here, or whenever you get out of Mooner SOI, we'll just straighten up our Kerbin Periapsis to make sure we get back into the atmosphere. So retrograde and ignition so that we get the periapsis to, say, 26 kilometers. Now that's good enough, I think. There's no heating, so we don't have to worry too much about that. And back to Kerbin we go. Okay, once we get to below 400 kilometers, we want to get rid of the stage. So uh, I usually turn normal, and that is after some advice. Uh, from a certain viewer because otherwise I n normally used to when I first started Kerbal Space Program I used to let go of the service module what I normally call this final stage uh, retrograde but normal is safer so we separate it off normal and that's either of the pink ones or pinkish purple ones so spacebar and we no longer have any fuel now but our periapsis is in the atmosphere so it's all right and then we hold retrograde, but surface retrograde. 
because that will be how the atmosphere is oriented. Okay, we are in the atmosphere. And we need the atmosphere to slow us down. Right now there don't seem to be any re-entry effects, regardless of the re-entry heating. We are now suborbital. So we are definitely coming down. Uh, I don't want to come down in the mountains. <laughs> That's one thing you might want to try to avoid. It's a little bit difficult though. Oops, I keep pausing it. Well, at this point we can arm the parachute. Oh, I decided to pop out. Alright, well, fair enough. I still have anti-aliasing off. Okay, the parachute is fully deployed. So I'm aware there are, of course, in-game tutorials, and I'm sure they've done a wonderful job of them, and this might be completely irrelevant, but on the off chance that it helps someone, uh, here we are. And so I'll recover vessel. And... Um, I actually want to go back. Well, let's just revert to BAB. So just to review, the most important things are that you have enough Delta V and we had more than enough. And like I said, 4,000 is safe. So you saw, see we had 4,961 that allowed us to go all the way to the moon. So you can get by with much less than this. In the engine report, make sure that your first stage has more than a thrust weight ratio of 1. You don't quite need a thrust weight ratio of 1 on the second stage, I would recommend 0.9 or more. Uh, this says 0.85, uh, sorry, 585, because it's reading the one atmosphere max thrust, which is for the Terrier 30.4, rather than the vacuum max thrust of 60. So it's only reading three tons of thrust instead of six. And um, but it has six tons of thrust, and you can just figure that out for yourself whether it's enough based on taking the vacuum thrust and dividing by 10, and that's how many tons. So that's the important thing there. And aside from the thrust weight ratio and the delta V, uh, in order to get to orbit, uh, there really isn't much else except for t the trajectory. And there uh, I gave you the altitudes and angles that I would normally advise. And the other thing is to not stray too far away from the prograde vector, otherwise your rocket may flip. And so the prograde vector is the little vector on the nav ball uh, that indicates the direction you're going in, the velocity. And so you should stay close to your velocity because otherwise the rocket will get too much to lift in one direction or another and tend to flip. I don't know how much aerodynamics they've implemented in the game yet, but they do have wing parts, so I assume there are some. And so the flippiness is a possibility. Um, and you should try to avoid that by just pointing at the prograde vector, then you won't get excessive lift one way or another. Um, and I think that's about it. So hopefully it is helpful somewhat. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.